take us through some background on each of the sites, but it's important to note that due diligence is the responsibility of anyone that responds to the RFP in addition to the background that we give you. So site one is located on Sapman Street between East New York Ave and Liberty Ave, and it has frontage on Powell Street as well. It's approximately 20,850 square feet in size. It has 192 feet of frontage on Sapman Street and 16.5 um, feet of frontage on Powell. So the main portion of, I'm gonna point this out. Um, so you can see this main portion of the site, the depth is about 100 feet, and then this smaller portion here as well that extends out to Powell Street, that's an additional 100, 100 feet there as well. Um, the site is M14 zoned, <coughs> which allows for light industrial uses, among other uses. It allows for a 1.5 FAR, so total development could allow for approximately 30,000 square feet, subject to height and other setback requirements. Um, the site is in both the East New York Industrial Business Zone and the Brownsville Urban Renewal Area. And actually, all three sites are located within urban renewal areas and what that means is that they don't have to go through the city's uniform land use review procedure if anyone's familiar with that many sales on um, on behalf of the city do have to go through what's called Euler but these three will not because of those urban renewal plans that being said the um, proposed development for each site will have to conform to the applicable urban renewal plan and those are provided in the site file which is available for download with the RFP um, so this site is currently vacant. It's surrounded by a chain link fence and EDP conducted a phase one environmental site assessment in 2009 and that, um, that ESA did find potential contamination and recommended a phase two ESA, just so you're aware of that. Um, and the ESA itself, a survey and applicable maps and again the urban renewal plan are all available in the site file and that's true for all of these sites. Um, site two is a little bit smaller. It is approximately 3,450 square feet. It's located at the corner of East New York and Van Sinderen Avenues. Um, it has 50 feet of frontage on East New York Ave and 65 feet on Van Sinderen. The site is also M14 zoned and it's also in the East New York Industrial Business Zone. This one is also in the East Brooklyn Business Improvement District and I'll explain more about the IBZ and the Business Improvement District um, later in the presentation. This one is in the East New York 2 urban renewal area. Um, and this one as well is currently vacant, surrounded by a chain linked fence, and similarly had a phase one site assessment done in 2009 that recommended a phase two as well. And finally, site three is located at 299 Georgia Avenue. <coughs> this one is just over 2,000 square feet of size and it has 22 feet of frontage on Georgia Avenue. And as opposed to our other two sites that we just ran through, this one is outside the industrial business zone and is actually commercially zoned. It has C34, I'm sorry, C43 zoning, which allows for a 3.4 commercial FAR. So that would allow for, you know, somewhere in the range of 7,000 square feet of building, again, subject to other height and setback requirements. Um, the site is again also currently vacant and has the same uh, environmental uh, suggestions as the first two. <laughs> um, the phase one was conducted in 2009. It recommended a phase two. And once again, the applicable urban renewal plan and um, environmental site assessment are in the site file. So just to show you the neighborhood and special districts, the purple outline is the industrial business zone. The orange is the business improvement district. So you see there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, and finally, the yellow highlighted roads are major truck routes. And you can also see, um, if you see Atlantic Avenue, for example, close to uh, site two, you can see some of the public transportation access that these sites uh, are privy to. So the East New York Ind Industrial Business Zone, which again, um, Sites one and two are both are located in the IBZ. It's home to 45 industrial and manufacturing businesses. Key subsectors are steel, metal fabrication, transportation, and others. And East New York IBZ tenants have access to business support through um, the Business Outreach Center Network, or BACnet. And for information, you can contact Kevin Chu, who unfortunately was not able to join us today, but his contact information is there. Now the East Brooklyn Business Improvement District, 
two, again, two of the sites, not the same two, are located within the bid's boundaries. The bid is home to 150 companies, or over 150 companies, including light industrial manufacturing, steel fabrication, transportation, and others. The bid provides services such as sanitation, brush removal, graffiti removal, and others. And the bid also um, assists with securing financing and economic development incentives, which could be very applicable to these sites. Uh, so that could be an important item to know as you're looking into the feasibility of development on these sites. Uh, for more information, you can contact Bill Wilkins, who is actually here today. Um, if you want to grab him at the end, he's in the red shirt there. And so finally, I will take us through the RFP procedure. Um, if you are interested in the purchase of one of these three sites or combination or all three, um, you can download the RFP, the request for proposals, at nypedc.com slash RFP slash ENY sale. We've tried to, <coughs> excuse me, we've tried to condense the RFP as much as possible. If you've seen some of our RFPs in the past, they're quite lengthy, but we tried to make this uh, as user-friendly as possible. So it's really just one questionnaire. And what we're asking is that you fill out the entire questionnaire and submit four copies back to EDC. Um, proposals will be evaluate, evaluated on the RFP selection criteria, which I'll run through in the next slide. As for the submission deadline, this is a more flexible RFP than some of our others. It is open for up to a year with rolling submission deadlines, and those are bi-monthly. So the first will be July 1st to, July 1st to coincide with the temporary use RFP, which you just heard about. Um, and thereafter, it will be open in, um, with, with bi-monthly submission deadlines for up to a year. Uh, we do encourage people to submit in, in the first review period if possible because we can um, choose to make sites unavailable after that first submission period if we so choose. But again, the anticipation is that this will be open for a year with those rolling deadlines. Uh, another important aspect of this RFP is that unlike other EDC sales, we will consider paying broker's commissions upon sale. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, when you have further questions, please email them to enysale at nypedc.com and we will respond with answers periodically at that, the RFP website. Um, again, because this is open for a year, we, we don't currently have any other information sessions scheduled, but we may choose to hold other information, um, other information sessions or if there are amendments to the RFP, we just encourage you to check that website periodically if you do have interest, um, just to see if there are any updates. And so, as for the selection criteria of the RFP, you know, the purchase price is just one of a few criteria that we will um, consider when we're evaluating responses to the RFP. Other criteria include the economic impact on and spending in New York City, the development team's qualifications. We want to be sure that you can follow through on the, um, the promises that you are making through your proposal. Um, again, in coinciding with that, the project's own financial feasibility, its design, and its integration into the surrounding community, and also land use maximization, um, basically in furtherance of our link goal of activating these sites and really having economic drivers within this neighborhood. Now the site may, may be eligible for a number of incentive and assistance programs, and this depends on the location, the proposed uses, and other criteria. Some of what I have listed here are as of right incentives, others are discretionary, so I would encourage you to reach out to the appropriate agency, um, or again, you know, work with, work with the IBZ or the, the bid as appropriate for the site that you're looking at to see which of these may help you. Uh, many of them are real estate tax abatements and other um, tax incentives that can help with financing and project feasibility. Others may help with um, brownfields cleanup if phase two is conducted, you find that there is re are remediation um, requirements for these sites. And so finally, I will um, turn it back to Elena maybe to talk about the Q&A. <coughs> sure, so thank you for your patience. I know that was a lot of material. So what we'll do now is just open it up to questions on either RFP. Um, if you could, we'll pass the mic around. If you don't mind speaking into the mic, I know it's a small room, but we're recording all of today's session so that we can make sure to answer every question thoroughly and transcribe what's discussed here. Um, but yes, if you could announce which RFP your question is um, <coughs> about when you start and 
and maybe introduce yourself as well, that would be helpful. Um, just really quickly before we get started, um, I encourage you to go to our RFP site on June 5th for the hard copy of all of these questions. We'll also post this PowerPoint on June 5th at that time. Um, and if you have questions about the temporary activation RFP, you can send them to vacantlofts at edc.com. If you have questions about the three sites that are available for sale, those questions should be directed to EMIC <coughs> at micedc.com. So with that, I'll turn it over. engineering studio and we uh, specialize in temporary structures and one of the things that sort of uh, I noticed when you mentioned that when you were looking at the vacant lot um, RFP you said you didn't have to go through the building department now generally uh, even for the most temporary types of structures you, you do have to go through the building department you have to either get a TPA you have to get TR1s etc um, and so my question is in, in this situation let's say if it was urban agriculture or something like that um, are, are you implying that the buildings don't have to meet uh, full wind and uh, building code requirements? Because generally, anything you know more than 30 days does. So I'm just um, curious because it would make a big difference economically as far as the cost of the structures, etc. Excellent question. And no, I'm not suggesting that those normal um, protocols don't apply. That was my misspeaking. What I mean more is that some of the additional regulations that apply to permanent structures where a foundation needs to be put in, um, we won't be looking at proposals that are for permanent structures. But all of the kind of the normal temporary building permits will still apply. So I apologize for the confusion there. Um, and we are asking that all consultants um, manage that process themselves, which isn't to say that EDC wouldn't like to be helpful, but the onus of identifying what the requirements are and actually obtaining the permits will be on the consultant, not on EDC. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, my name is Abdullah, I work for Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. I have a question about the phase ones that you guys mentioned. Are you guys gonna make the findings from those phase ones available or would we? Sorry, if that was unclear. The, the entire phase one assessments are available in the site file and you can download those at com slash RFP slash ENY sale. Um, and yes, it is the entire ESA that's available for each site. Are they available for all 15? They're not. We only have them for those three, I believe. Um, and they're not included in the temporary activation RFP. So if you want access to those three, you'll have to download the other RFP. Um, we, we might be able to put it up on the website as part of this answer document, but no promises there. Certainly, you can access it immediately, access it immediately through the other RFP. Hi, I'm Neil Graven. So is there gonna be like um, community set-asides as part of the, the, the process, or is, would that be a requirement of consultants, or is that something that this organization is going to ask? Can you elaborate what you mean So by for community residents who'd like to have businesses, will there be set-asides? Or will there be like maybe specific trainings for people to get licenses and be able to take advantage of this opportunity? So there's no current plan to designate any lots for any specific use. The activation will be entirely dependent on the responses we receive. So we're very, we're particularly interested in responses that involve the local community, that represent the interests and desires of local residents and that are particularly desired by local residents, but there are no lots set aside for specific training programs. We would love to see a response of a, a training program, um, but I imagine that would be a partnership between a community group and possibly a temporary building company. EDC is very happy to do some matchmaking there. If there are community groups that have an idea but might not have the technical expertise about space, We've spoken with a lot of groups and we would love to do introductions, but there's no, there, yeah, nothing has been specifically set aside. Uh, 
What's, what's the EDC stance on um, businesses that aren't like currently in, incorporated or um, you know where where do they fit in in, in those kinds of things? So EDC itself can only do business with um, registered and incorporated <coughs> companies. We can certainly help people go through the process of registering with the state. Um, for for example, a business that. I imagine a number of responses will be partnerships between groups of different expertises. Um, so someone with expertise on the, the building side, someone with expertise either as an operator or a retailer, et cetera. Um, we'll leave that, I would say, to whoever the primary consultant is. Um, if they want to work with those kinds of businesses, certainly EDC could encourage it. Um, but if there's a, a plan that wanted to work with businesses that aren't fully developed, we'd be very interested in seeing that. and maybe some kind of business assistance and development project. Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. to say that for some of them, we may be able to identify how long they've been vacant. Honestly, the, the data that I've looked through is not particularly thorough, and I worry that even if I posted those numbers, they wouldn't actually be accurate. I think the maximum on any of the databases I've looked through says eight years, and I know for a fact some of them have been vacant for longer than eight years. So um, if that would be helpful, I can put that together, but as a caveat, it, probably not entirely accurate. In terms of environmental issues, I'm afraid we don't have phase ones conducted on most of these sites, um, and that would be the environmental review information we would have. So again, I'll see if I can um, take those three phase ones that we do have and, and include them when I post things on June 5th, but, um, but I'm afraid that's all we have. I apologize. Thank Hello, uh, my name is Richard with 596 Acres. Um, I'm just wondering if we apply for multiple in the temporary program, but we but you only choose a few. Is that like we can apply for more than would be chosen? Great question. Yes, um, absolutely. You can apply to activate five, and we can decide that we only want a contract with you for one. Um, you should feel free in a proposal to propose multiple variations of your plan if you can see it going in a few different ways. We will certainly take liberty when we're reading your proposal and interviewing you to propose alternatives if we um, would like to, to redirect you a little bit. But certainly, um, if you submit a proposal for five lots and we're really excited about one, we won't put your proposal aside because it was for five and we only Justin Kramer, Cypress Cell, Local Development Corporation. Uh, wondering if there is any sort of, this may be too early, but any sort of long-term plan for the temporary sites? So after the contracts end, what would happen to that? It's an excellent question. It varies by site. There are some that we think do have long-term development plans by the agency that owns them. There are some that currently have no plans. I certainly think the hope of this pilot is that we will prove there is market opportunity on these sites. And for those that don't have development plans, I certainly think there may be opportunities either to talk about sales or to talk about continued temporary activation. But that's all extremely hypothetical at this point and very dependent on how the pilot goes. Um, so yes. Are those temporary plans available for us to see by chance? They're the ones that we know of that are yeah, a little bit down the exactly. I'm afraid they, they they vary a lot 